A very good morning, good afternoon, or indeed good evening, wherever in the world you happen to be, and welcome to today's webinar, which takes selecting the right cargo containment system as its theme. The webinar is 45 minutes in length and is generously sponsored by LNT. The webinar forms part of Riviera's Tankers and Terminals Webinar Week, where the focus is on gas carriers. Now, ladies and gentlemen, before we go away, I'd like to share some key information which will help you get the most out of today's webinar. Please be assured we will send you the recording. Please do submit your questions at any time because we will do Q&A throughout the webinar and any questions that we don't get to, we will come back to you in writing within a week of transmission, meaning there is every reason for you to get involved and send in those questions through the messenger. Please do stay tuned into the end so you don't miss out. I guarantee that over the next 45 minutes, you're going to receive powerful, exclusive and original insights that will really benefit your business. So please stay tuned. And finally, please complete the exit survey and in turn, we'll send you the presentations. Time I said a word or two about your hosts, Riviera Maritime Media. Riviera is a maritime and offshore information specialist active in four areas, news, events, jobs, and data. In order to learn more, please visit the dedicated website, www.rivieramm.com. This is me, Edwin, Edwin Lampert. I'm head of content at Riviera Maritime Media, and I'll be moderating proceedings today. So let's look at what's on the program for today's webinar. We'll be variously assessing safety and design. We'll look at CAPEX and OPEX versus other CCS, expected BOR, sloshing characteristics, use in LNG transport, as well as use in LNG fuel tanks. Let's also now look at the running order, or in other words, how it's going to go. Presentations will be run consecutively and followed by open discussion. As you know, please submit your questions at any time because we do do Q&A throughout the webinar. At the end of the webinar, we will share key takeaways and conclusions and also preview what's next. Time to meet our panelists and we've got a fantastic panel in place. We'll be hearing from Carlos, Carlos Guerrero. Carlos, of course, is global market leader, gas carriers and oil tankers with the Classification Society Bureau Veritas. We'll be hearing from Kettle, Kettle Strand. Kettle is Chief Executive Officer with LNT Marine. And completing our lineup, I'm delighted that we have Chris in situ, Chris Klukas. Chris, of course, is Principal Consultant with Liquefied Gas Consultancy. Over the course of the next 45 minutes, ladies and gents, we'll find time for a poll or two. In order to participate, the poll will come on your screen. You'll have the option of clicking the various options which, which relate to the question. Choose the one that speaks to your interest simply by clicking. And as you know, we'll be doing questions throughout the webinar, so do submit your questions at any time. Well, ladies and gentlemen, more than enough from me. High time we heard from our presenters. So first up is, of course, Carlos. So Carlos, good sir, as and when you're ready, the floor, they say, is yours. So it's, it's my pleasure, first of all, uh, to, be, to be with you, all of you uh, today to uh, show uh, our uh, views on the cargo containment system selection for uh, for LNG. Um, uh, thank you very much, of course, Riviera Maritime, for the invitation to to share uh, our views on this uh, on this uh, interesting topic. Well, uh, first of all, I want to to show uh, of obviously that uh, the main point when uh, we discuss about selection of uh, containment systems is that uh, the regulatory framework is already uh, available. It's uh, well known that uh, nowadays for any type of uh, a vessel that uh, has uh, LNG as a cargo or LNG as a fuel, so for different purposes, the regulatory uh, framework is available uh, basically from the IMO for, uh, with the IGC code and the IGF code, which are applicable for uh, the first for transportation, the second for LNG as a fuel. 
there are many types of containment systems available and so it's hard to say that there is one right containment system for every application and I will show you basically that there are many options and depending on the purpose you may be able to select as mentioned in this slide different type of tanks or containment systems. I think there is one basic issue when we speak about selection of containment systems that is the volume uh, required for uh, the application and the purpose of this uh, tank or the purpose of the ship. Uh, basically here uh, you have uh, a little bit of co a controversial uh, table in which I differentiate independent tanks and membrane tanks. Independent tanks that are basically type C, B or A and uh, the red dots, the red color in the dots, uh, doesn't necessarily uh, mean that uh, this cargo containment system uh, is not uh, available or cannot be used. Is the uh, just uh, a, bi a bit of uh, uh, discussion, open discussion about the uh, advantages or disadvantages that uh, every of these containment system uh, can uh, basically uh, face when uh, it is used for uh, cargo, for example, for transportation, for floating uh, applications, or for LNG uh, as a fuel. Uh, you can see basically that there are other aspects that uh, has to be considered, have to be considered like a volume efficiency, of course, when we talk about the right containment system selection, uh, the volume efficiency is key and for large uh, volumes, of course, we always say that the membrane containment system is the most efficient, uh, followed by the type A, type B and uh, last uh, but not least the, the C the type C, which is independent, but uh, utilizes a lot of uh, space on the cargo hold of the ship. There are other aspects like ma technology maturity. Of course, not all the containment systems have been already used for LNG. Uh, in some cases, in, in very few occasions, in uh, very specific projects. Uh, also, we can discuss about if the project is a new build or conversion project in which uh, maybe an independent type C uh, might be more convenient in some cases. Uh, availability from the shipyard point of view for the installation of the system is also key. In some uh, cases, of course, type C and type B are very convenient because uh, you can build the independent tank outside of the shipyard and then install directly in the cargo hold or in the space dedicated for LNG fuel tanks. So it's more easy. Oil of rate, of course, is a key uh, aspect that I'm going to address. And sloshing. Again, I mentioned, of course, that there are uh, systems that are a bit less convenient than others, and this is the meaning of the red dots or, or yellow or green. Uh, all in this consideration, I have also considered only 20,000 cubic meters as a limit, just to, to uh, actually to focus on LNG fuel applications. So, meaning that uh, when I uh, obviously discuss about the um, how appropriate is a type C tank for a fuel uh, application is uh, considering always, or for LNG banking in ships, is always considering a maximum 20,000 cubic meters of uh, volume. In this slide, I will uh, be quick because it's just a kind of uh, a statistics of the of the market, uh, but this uh, focus on uh, big ships. So now here I'm addressing basically uh, LNG uh, vessels which are above 40,000 cubic meters. And you uh, can see basically that there are uh, four types uh, basically uh, um, used already, but uh, the trend is clear in favor of the membrane. And again, here there are two factors that are uh, important for the selection. The factor of the volume efficiency on the cargo hold, so you can optimize the uh, LNG volume to be transported if you use a membrane compared to other systems, and also the boil of rate, which is now going really uh, to a low side of the, uh, uh, going to limits that we uh, actually didn't uh, think about uh, just uh, five years ago. As an example of this technology, I wanted just to highlight about a GTT membrane, uh, which is one of the, I would say, uh, leaders in the, in the market nowadays. And you can see uh, that uh, this technology has been applied in many uh, occasions on LNG carriers, and now there is an evolution of the technology by means of which they are able to reduce this boil of uh, rate up to 0.7% per volume uh, of the cargo uh, per day, which is a very, very uh, efficient technology by increasing basically the polyurethane foam 
of the uh, insulation uh, panels. Uh, the volume occupation I already mentioned, and you can see in this section of this uh, ship, in this slide, that actually you take advantage of all the, the cargo hold of the ship. And uh, finally, also another aspect that is important for slushing applications, these technologies have been adapted uh, lately for FSR use, for instance by reinforcement of the primary barrier or even reinforcement also on the polyurethane foam, increasing the foam densities. And when we are talking about small scale, just to finalize the presentation, small scale LNG bunkering ships and gas fuel ships uh, basically are uh, seen uh, many times by the industry as very similar in the selection of Containment, uh, containment systems. Again, I put here statistics of the fleet and uh, vessels on order, uh, both. Uh, on the fleet and, and on order, you can see that basically type C has been uh, the most uh, interesting technology. Uh, maybe in this case also the, th the fact that uh, big companies like Barcilla, TGE or others have uh, got a lot of experience on these uh, type C technologies and uh, in the, uh, in the uh, market we have many uh, vessels already with these uh, type C independent tanks even if uh, the volume occupation is not well optimized, uh, this is, uh, I mean, uh, the trend uh, nowadays. And you can see some comparison also with uh, vessels in the range of uh, 16 to 20,000 cubic meters that have uh, used uh, already membrane or uh, uh, type C or eventually most type, which is not, uh, I would say, uh, a trend today for this type of ships. LNG bunkering ships now are being built basically with type C and also with membrane containment system when, when the capacity is above uh, 12,000 cubic meters, basically. So that's uh, the end of the presentation. I thank you for your attention. I hand over to, to Edwin. Thank you very much. Thank you, Carlos. Great opening presentation. Ladies and gentlemen, please do keep those questions coming. We now turn our attention to Kettle. So Kettle, as and when you're ready, sir. Thank you, Edwin. Um, I will present a few slides to explain what we at LNT Marine think will be important for cargo co containment systems in the coming years and how our LNT A box may fit into this picture. As the LNG market has developed and become more diverse and flexible, we think that there are a few features that will be particularly important for cargo co containment systems going forward. There will be more diversity in capacity to serve new trades. Partial discharge and partial loading will be more common. Ship-to-ship -ship operations will be required. Energy efficiency and low, lowest possible carbon footprint will be increasingly important. In order to accommodate these needs, we think that there will be a need for more shipyards capable of building the LNG carriers. We need more flexible ship designs and size classes of ships. Tank systems must be able to mitigate sloshing and operate with partially loaded tanks. Boil off rates must be minimized and of course the capex must be as reasonable as possible. Uh, at LNT Marine, we have developed the LNT A box containment system with the aim to solve these type of challenges. The LNT A box consists of an independent tank type A as the primary barrier and a cargo tank support system to keep the tank in position in the hull and act as a thermal break to the hull structure. On the hull side, we have an insulation system with a full secondary barrier. And in between, we have an accessible inter-barrier space. Tank type A is known to offer the simplest design and construction according to the IMO IGC code. But in addition to that, it also offers a number of other benefits. The independent tank structure enables parallel building activities during construction of the vessel and the flex flexible prismatic shape enables uh, high volume utilization of the vessel. And since it is a self-supporting tank structure, there is internal structure inside the tank preventing sloshing, which also means that we do not have filling restrictions with type A tanks. So as I I have explained, since we have a self-supporting tank, all the loads from the cargo are transferred to the hull structure through the support system, which means that for LNT A box, we don't have 
any cargo loads or sloshing acting on the insulation system, which is also giving a number of advantages for the design and construction of the insulation system. For instance, that we can use low density foam optimized for thermal performance uh, rather than the compressive strength. In the LNTA box, we use pre manufactured TU panels in two layers fixed to the hull in a stud bolt in its center. This gives a flexible and light system which is easy to install and, and requiring very reasonable tolerance requirements for the shipyard when they build this. LNTA box is a flexible um, uh, flexible cargo containment system suitable for various sizes and various applications. The first project based on LNTA box was a 45,000 cubic LNG carrier called Saga Dwan, which has now been delivered and is in operation. And at LNT Marine, we are now working with new vessel designs for larger vessels such as 80,000 cubic and 174,000 cubic. And in the other end of the scale, we are also looking into large-scale LNG fuel tanks based on the same principal technologies. Okay, thank you. Then I leave it back to you, Edwin. Thank you very much indeed, Kettle. Great presentation again, which has generated a number of questions. Ladies and gentlemen, please do keep those questions coming. We will take as many as we can. But more immediately, I'm delighted we have Chris in situ. So as and when you're ready, Chris, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Edwin. I hope you can uh, uh, hear me and I hope you can see my screen. Um, and I'd certainly like to thank the um, previous uh, presenters um, for uh, setting the scene for this and uh, also to uh, our audience for, for logging in. I hope this is going to be of interest to you. And uh, I really want to look at the bigger picture, but pose the question, is it really as ABC easy? Because that is, of course, the tank types that are mentioned in the IGC code. Well, all over uh, boardrooms, I think we've been hearing recently uh, people who've been uh, saying, well, we bought a, an LNG carrier, what do we do next? Well, what possibly can there be? Well, actually, the opportunities, the options are a bit bewildering. We're looking at cargo capacity, design speed, propulsion arrangements, boil off rate, boil off handling, uh, versus propulsion, and we must always remember the lessons of history. Now, traditionally, LNG carriers have been designed for quite fast speeds, typically 19.5 knots. But in a recent presentation by Potem and Partners, they logged the average speeds of the LNG fleet over the past three and a half years or so. Okay, this is before the COVID um, changes to the market. So this is a, a good snapshot. And you can see these 19 and a half knot ships were on average trading somewhere about 13 and a half knots. This has a big implication for the, uh, the power um, installed on the ship. If you don't understand oil off, this can seriously damage your wealth. The way it's calculated is not just one simple number, but lots and lots of correction factors. And this is very important to fully understand. And if you get it wrong, this can be very commercially uh, serious. Although if you do come unstuck, I do know a couple of lawyers who um, uh, can assist, they understand the subject and also um, an expert witness that can help. So what are we looking at really here? We've got the choice of diesel propulsion now, quite a wide range. Remember only 12 years ago, it was steamships only. We've got high pressure versus low pressure two strokes. What service speed do we go for? What sea margin do we have? Are we going to think about power take off and power take in? What about the balancing between the boil off and the consumption for the actual service speed of the ship? Does this give us the option of reliquifaction? Complete reliquifaction or partial? And as has been said by both the previous speakers, we're looking to minimize CO2 emissions, our footprint, basically to deliver the maximum possible cargo on the voyage. So looking at the big picture, looking what's going on in the uh, cargo compressor room, effectively the layout, 
we've got the gas from the tanks that are going to supply the engines. And now we've got the option of reliquefaction, which was uneconomic in the days of steamship. Liquefaction offers, offers some uh, flexibility, but at a cost increase for capital and operating. And also it has a power demand implication. Complete reliquefaction, maximum flexibility. Partial relic gives you the ability to uh, save the excess uh, gas boil off that there would be at a reduced speed, depending on what specification you put in. There are various types of plants available. The Brereton sim simple cycle nitrogen expansion was used uh, in the early days, but uh, now we have um, marinized uh, multiple component refrigeration plants. These are much more complicated, but a fraction of the power consumption, and they're, they're available in all ranges of sizes and specification. The important thing to grasp is the balance between the boil-off uh, produced versus the ship speed. So for a steamship, because they are relatively fuel inefficient, a boil-off typical balance would be about 12 and a half knots. This is the speed that the boil-off coming from the tanks would drive the ship at. Whereas if we go to more frugal engines, that boil-off rate could actually give us 18 and a half knots. And if our average trading is 13 and a half, you can see the mismatch, which is where liquefaction comes in. And of course, as Carlos and uh, Kettle have both said, reducing the boil off by improving the insulation. Now LNG as fuel is another area that is developing. And it, again, it's not as easy as ABC. In fact, it used to always be just type C. Today, we have the options of independent types A, type B, and even the integral tanks, the membranes, are now mimicking almost independent tanks by building in a brick-like structure uh, with external uh, stiffness. But it's the same product, it's just different applications. So there's so much to learn from the industry's 55-year history and safety record, applying these lessons of history to the new considerations. So for example, on LNG carrier, the cargo is the fuel. So tank capacity for the fuel isn't a consideration, whereas on an LNG fire chip, it is. As I said, we have the option of, um, of integral tanks, which give you the, or independent A, B, and C, they give you the uh, advantages, especially compared with the previous type C, normal choice. But again, the boil off rate is absolutely critical. And LNG handling practices, they're changing. So you must support and join the Society of Gas as a Marine Fuel in order to keep up to date. That's the, uh, the analogous organization for SIGTO for the bulk carriers. So remember the lessons of history, remember your ABC. LNG has got a, a really exciting future, both as a cargo and as a fuel, but we must remember that we've got to keep the standards high. So remember your ABC. Thank you for your attention. And back over to you now, Edwin. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed, Chris. Great presentation. Testament to all three presenters is that we've generated a stream of questions. Ladies and gentlemen, do keep them coming. We'll tackle as many as we can. And as you know, any we don't, you get a written response. So every reason to keep them flowing. Just ahead of those questions, let's do a poll or two. So do stand by for that. So here's your first one, ladies and gents. It will be appearing on your screens momentarily. The question is, what will be the most important factor for selection of cargo containment systems going forward? On your screen are four options, volume utilization, boil off, flexibility and partial loading capability or price. I appreciate you cannot see the results, I can, and I will be sharing them in an article after the webinar. But what I can tell you is approximately 50% have opted for flexibility and partial loading. It's neck and neck at about 20% with boil off and volume utilization and 10% on price. Let's do one more poll, then I promise we will go to those questions. So do stand by. So it's on a scale of one to five, as you can see. The current system of shipyards adopting specific license agreements with cargo system designers limits customer choice. And then you can opt for strongly agree, 
through to disagree strongly, depending on how you feel. What I can tell you is about 40% agree strongly, and then it tapers down. 22% uh, on two, 13% on three, 12% on four, and about 4% disagreeing strongly. But the numbers are obviously changing all the time. But we we have a an indication of market sentiment there. And as I say, full results in an article after the webinar. Now, ladies and gentlemen, let's turn our attention to those questions. So do stand by for those because they're coming your way right now. So our first one is indeed for Chris. So Chris, please, uh, please prepare. And it goes a little something, uh, a little something like this. Um, I'll read it out right now. So here's the question, Chris. It reads, boil off in loaded and boil off in ballast or partially loaded condition. That is the question. Yard or GTT give only one value for BOR, e.g. 0.09%, but then many ask, is it of the loaded capacity or loaded quantity? One for you, Chris, to start, please. Well, do you remember I said lots of small print, lots of factors <laughs> to consider? Um, the question was about GTT. There are, of course, other types of containment systems available. The answer to the question is this, that the, the GTT figures assume the tanks are all completely full. So the figure is based on the 98 or 98.5% filling. However, if you have lower filling, you might think logically that there would be um, less boil off. Not necessarily, because boil off requires a surface. As the level drops, there is more surface and the ship is moving around. So the boil off rate is actually influenced significantly by the, um, the, the environmental considerations. Also, I discussed this with GTT uh, in, in connection with an expert witness case, and they, they told me that they've never actually given any guarantees about ballast voyages for the simple reason that ballast voyages are done under such totally different conditions. How full is the tank? We're really talking about heat transfer coefficients um, between liquid um, and, and vapor, so a conduction convection, and that does make an awful lot of difference. So the short answer is the headline figure is based upon all tanks full, and I think the smaller uh, clauses say no pumps running, and you have to exclude tanks with pumps running, because if you look at the insulation, which is fantastically efficient on an industrial scale, then the heat generated by a single pump can actually uh, virtually double the heat input into that tank, depending on the pump size. So the short answer is read the small print carefully, okay? I'm sorry, I can't be more specific. With independent tanks, it is a little bit uh, different, but again, there are lots of exclusions and so on because of the um, change environmental conditions. So for example, cold water, um, cold climates will reduce less, uh, produce less boil off than warm areas. I hope that answers the question. Thank you. Our next question looks at type C. What are the adva what advantages are there for type C, type C versus membrane for small LNG carriers? And why are they typically selected? Perhaps Carlos, you could kick us off on that, but others welcome to, to join. Yes, uh, indeed. Well, uh, thank you for the question. Very interesting. Of course, uh, you have seen the statistics uh, on the market on a small scale LNG and the comparison between type C and, and membrane, which are the solutions that are implemented nowadays, uh, also for bunkering ships, for instance. Um, Obviously, Type C has been preferred many times uh, by shipyards because they uh, are not depending on a single supplier for, for the containment systems and they can build uh, independent tanks, uh, Type C, basically on other facilities. Uh, so in parallel with the ship construction, basically this is giving an advantage, uh, flexibility and uh, cost efficient uh, construction uh, way. So I think that's uh, the reason why we see more, much more type C tanks than uh, membrane these days. Thank you. Uh, Chris, you're welcome to come in. Otherwise, we'll move yeah. on to Kettle. Well, I think Kettle will probably um, give a lot more insight into this. So if I, I'll just put a very short piece in. Um, when we built um, in my 
is with the shortage of um, the seven and a half thousand uh, bunker vessel Kairos, the Type C tank was the natural choice because, of course, it does allow you, um, if you're not uh, handling cargo every day, the pressure buildup. Um, it gives you potentially five, seven days. We use CNG, but um, liquefaction is always possible. And it's this margin. And in fact, there was a series of Japanese coastal ships um, that, it, that relied on this. And they had, I think, a seven day capability of pressure holding. So that does actually help. You do accept there is a loss of hull volume. So if you go with a lower tank pressure, and traditionally membranes, as Carlos will tell you, have been limited to 0.7 of a bar, then, um, and also type A's, um, that does give you one limitation. So it's an operational advantage in many, many cases. And for the small ships, you just put up with the volume capability. I'd like to turn our attention to sloshing limits on LNG membranes. Uh, one of our audience members says there's a tendency to increase them above what's stated in the cargo manual. Also, there is no extensive industry research, says this member of the audience, and evidence for such operation. Uh, there may be differing views on the panel. Um, we look forward to your, your various feedback. Perhaps we'll start with Chris and then come to Carlos and Kettle. Certainly, you're welcome to come in. Well, first of all, I do think the um, sloshing uh, limits are based on experience and a lot of testing. I mean, I've seen personally, I've been to the, um, the facilities at GTT as part of uh, training in the industry. And um, I've also seen the sloshing rigs and sloshing um, experiments done in various universities. So I do think there is some um, science behind it, but, but it is, of course, um, based on uh, complex interactions, multiple degrees of freedom, it is not easy to predict. Uh, but we've been running membrane ships for, what, 55 years, Carlos, pretty well, 50 at least. So yeah. there is experience and there is knowledge about this. Now, whether people say, well, okay, it says 70% in the, in the book, if we go to 80%, we're on the safe side, that's a, an owner's choice. But I do think the, uh, the limits that are um, are set are, are based on experience and history, and I have full confidence in them. Carlos, anything to add? Indeed, yes. Uh, I can add also that uh, on top of uh, GTT's uh, rig for uh, the test, uh, there is uh, ability today uh, to perform computer fluid dynamics, and, and we uh, in class societies we are doing also that uh, kind of studies in order to um, basically uh, assess the, the results of the of the sloshing studies uh, from GTT. Um, it is true that for LNG transportation, uh, I think sloshing has become also a kind of uh, discussion, new discussion, but in the frame of uh, partial loadings and uh, partial delivery cargos and things like this, and also in the frame of new vessels that uh, have been designed recently uh, with four tanks, and uh, 200,000 cubic meters instead of uh, standard 174. Um, just because the geometry of the tanks are very similar, but the length, uh, the volume of the, every tank is a bit higher than the, the, the standard. No? But, uh, but I would say that uh, sloshing is uh, well known and there is no big issue on that uh, at the moment uh, for, for any containment system, I guess. Kettle, anything to add on sloshing, please? Yeah, no, I, I guess uh, Chris and Carlos has already responded well to that. But of course, it's uh, we all know it's it's well uh, proven by by GTT membranes over over decades. So so no doubt in that. But uh, uh, of course, <laughs> a, a self-supporting tank within the whole structure will always have an advantage with regards to, to liquid movements inside the tank. So yeah. thank you, Chris. You do. Um expert witness work and, and you did in fact mention legal issues in your presentation have you seen an increase in contractual disputes when it comes to lng boil off because of the new trading patterns of lng in the market i certainly have obviously i can't discuss any um, cases in detail but um, there's a, um, a historic tendency in the industry that was the boil off rate it was what it was and it was just accepted and it was worked around. And <clears throat> I had this even when I was at British Gas and we were running the original Type A uh, ships, the Methane Princess and Progress. We just knew by experience what it was. Um, these days, 
um, you're getting lots of individual companies coming in that are traders and their um, trading economics are based upon um, accurate quantifications of fuel costs, which are one of the biggest operating costs in the, the daily um, uh, rates of the ship. And what they have found is that sometimes the charter party descriptions do not really cover in detail all the variations that occur. And if someone has um, just put a single figure for the boil off rate without any um, sort of quantification or uh, qualification of it, then this can actually come uh, quite a, a serious commercial matter. As I said, this can seriously harm your wealth. And yes, I have seen more cases in the last three or four years than I have done in um, previous 25 years. This is something that people are focusing on because fuel economy is emissions, if you think about it. Reduce the fuel you use, you reduce the emissions. There is really a big trend on this area. Thank you. Speaking about um, the importance of, of reliable operations, one of our audience members reports that they've seen reliability issues with reliquification sorry, with reliquification plant and ship managers have faced many cargo claims due to its failure, though it does not affect charters as it's directly passed on to the ship managers. Given ch the choice through steam turbine vessel, were not fuel efficient, but they're more reliable. Anything, is there, here's the question, is there anything industry is doing to increase the reliability of machinery um, in the name of efficiency and reducing the carbon footprint? Perhaps Carlos, you can tackle that one first and certainly we, we can bring in the others. Yeah, Carlos. thank you. Thank you. It's a, it's a good question, of course, and I think it's the key issue now in the operation of LNG carriers. Uh, basically, when we are talking about these uh, modern designs uh, with uh, reliquification systems, there are new new systems developed in the last uh, years that are being installed in many of these uh, standard uh, membrane ships in, in Korea, basically. Uh, indeed, when uh, somebody is developing a new system, uh, no matter if we are talking about subcooling or uh, reliquification, nitrogen, uh, mixed refrigerant, whatever is the, the system, it might be the case that uh, the performance of the system is not uh, in at least in the first uh, pilot project is not as as required and uh, of course there might be some issues for for the ship operators uh, because they have the commitments the agreements on the charter party with the with the charters basically uh, the market is uh, driving uh, all the stakeholders to this type of solutions I think, of course, we still have a way to go and a lot of uh, work to be done to uh, satisfy all the stakeholders. From class point of view, we don't have any word on the, on performance of the system. We just uh, take care of the safety, uh, of course, uh, safety issues. But uh, as we know that this is also a key matter in the industry, I think uh, I think we, we can help as well. And, uh, uh, charters, owners, and, uh, and shipyards to, to solve these uh, these issues. Thank you. May I invite Kettle to share his perspective? Yeah, and, uh, and of course, uh, for our part, we are, we are focused on the containment. And as, as Chris has already mentioned a few times, uh, the dri a key driver for us is to minimize the boil-off rate. Mm -hmm. so, so you minimize the problem you have to deal with. Either it is by the machinery consumption or the relic plant. So, so, so our focus is, of course, to and also in much of what we put into research and development forward is is how to reduce the boil off rates because that's that's the starting point for for this this challenge and, and minimized energy consumption. Thank you, Chris. Well. Um... I mean, the, the question predicated on uh, steamships, they actually dealt with the, uh, the boil off very simply and efficiently. And it's absolutely true. Actually, harking back to a little something that Kettle said a little bit earlier, the very first commercial ships were about uh, 30,000 cubic, so not a, a mile away from the Saga Dawn, but their design boil off was about 0.3% per day. And that's one of the reasons they were fast ships, because that gave you the balance of gas versus power um, and therefore, they, they were always designed in that way. Um, yes, steamships elegantly deal with the boil off. And it was a logical choice at the time when more than half the world's fleet was, was using steam. But never forget that um, steamships went out of fashion 
in the uh, late 70s, early 80s, when um, the, the cost of fuel uh, rose dramatically. LNG boil off was treated as free fuel because you couldn't reliquify because the cost of liquefaction was prohibitive if you use steam. There's a circular argument here. Also, don't forget the lack of people with steam engineering training uh, meant that you did have um, a shortage of, of skilled and experienced engineers. And you also got down to about two single suppliers for um, uh, steam technology, whereas there used to be many, many makers of marine turbines. So um, the, the whole picture is changing. But the, the second point of the question was uh, reliquifaction plant reliability. Oh, yes. Um, I worked in my early days on LNG plant design. And the nitrogen expansion cycle, very simple, robust, almost agricultural type uh, technology, but very expensive on fuel. The multiple component refrigerants are more difficult, but um, they give you more efficiency. The key to it all is minimize your oil off rate by your insulation. I'm sure the designers, I've spoken to several of the option uh, designers of liquid plants, and they are always working with their clients to improve reliability and design out problems. Just as we've done over the years with LPG liquefaction and ethylene. And these days, the ethylene and, uh, and LPG liquefaction systems are much more reliable. And I think that's what we're looking to for LNG carriers as well. So yes, there's always uh, teething problems when things are new, but um, I think persevere, that's the way forward. Thank you. I'm going to try and squeeze in one more question on boil off rate because there's such an interest in this topic before a couple of polls. Gents, if you can be very sort of pointed in your answers, I, I know it's difficult. So here's here's that question. Uh, in case of LNG as fuel, ships uh, boil off rate is still calculated based on 98% filling when the membrane tank is used, or in this case, boil off rates calculated based on partial loads. Also, how are environmental factors uh, expected to to factor into this. We're talking about temperature, sea, air, and waves, and so on and so forth. Perhaps Carlos first, Kettle, and then Chris. Come in, Carlos. Yeah, thank you, Edwin. Uh, again, a very interesting question uh, and not easy to, to answer, huh, by the way. <laughs> uh, indeed, indeed, as we uh, have experience with, uh, with this uh, long uh, formula that uh, Chris uh, mentioned also in the presentation, uh, for the time being, we are always talking about boil off rate when the, the tank is fully laden. Uh, this is clear, uh, typically 98 or eventually 98.5 in some cases, or filling, uh, filling limit. But um, I think this is very important for the industry. Uh, I think there are many factors now in gas fuel ships in particular, uh, which of course will have the fuel tank uh, partially loaded during the, during the transportation, during the, the, the voyage. So basically it is important for them to know. Uh, we still have to uh, develop, uh, I would say, some more tools uh, possibly, uh, also based on uh, empirical data and data that are gathered gather in the in the ships during operation it is it is my view thank you uh, coming kettle please yeah uh, as as carlos mentioned this is a rather complex uh, complex issue with many variables but but one important aspect though to remember is that uh, as as chris explained the boil off rate in terms of percentage is increasing when the amount inside the tank is being reduced because again the relative surface of the tank is is bigger related to the cargo but if you look at the boil off gas amount how much boil off is boiling off that should in theory be more or less the same even though the percentage is going down, the amount of gas is, is less, so the percentage is of a smaller amount. So in theory, the boil of gas you need to deal with should in theory be more or less the same. But then there are all these more dynamic factors, which is uh, with movements and temperatures and, and so on and so on, which is disturb disturbing the picture a little bit. So it, it's not easy to give an easy answer to that. Thank you. Chris, uh, perhaps a concise answer if you can on, on this one. Well, when it comes to the boil off rate, it is what it is. And much of the experience is on small ships, short sea, where they fuel every two or three days. Um, and we're, we're now seeing the expansion into the deep sea market. Um, 
we can learn from the experience of the big ships, but uh, there's going to be an element of um, learning by experience. And this is one of the reasons we have SGMF to share the experience. So do support the society. Thank you. Ahead of returning to our panellists for their key thoughts and conclusions, another couple of polls. So stand by, ladies and gentlemen. Um, current industry standards regulating, guess what LNG boil-off gas calculation disputes is? Take your choice. Uh, inadequate, adequate or robust? At the moment, uh, oh, it's, it's a movable feast. Um, fairly evenly split between adequate and inadequate. Lagging about 30% behind is robust. Full results in an article after the webinar. And just one more poll, and then we will return to our panelists in the order they presented for their key thoughts and conclusions. Here we go. Is enough being done to spread the lessons learned from the bulk LNG trades 55 years of experience? About 90% are, well, it's very, 70% uh, are actually saying no. So mm. uh, the, the overwhelming majority are saying enough is not being done to spread mm. lessons learned. So quite a powerful message there. Mm. Speaking of powerful messages, let us come back to our panelists in the order that they presented. So that, of course, was Carlos, Kettle and Chris for their key conclusions and takeaways. Come in, Carlos. Thank you. Uh, well, uh, I think a key conclusion for me uh, could be that uh, a selection of cargo containment system is uh, obviously a, a key factor for the success of the of the project, and it uh, will depend on the on the many factors that I have uh, mentioned during today's presentation. Uh, as a class society, we can say that uh, obviously uh, we are here to help. Uh, not only from uh, the safety point of view, but also in other aspects in the selection, because uh, we have uh, had a lot of experience in the LNG transportation uh, sector, and nowadays also in the LNG as fuel, LNG bunkering ships and LNG as fuel. And uh, for all challenges that uh, you may be facing, I think uh, all class societies can support, and also organizations that we know very well, like SICTO or SGMF, uh, uh, to develop the, the industry uh, safe, uh, which is the, the, key, the key issue. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Kettle, please. Yeah, thank you, and thanks for interesting discussion and, and, and questions. I think the most, most interesting takeaway for me is that uh, the, the participants actually considered flexibility and um, um, uh, mitigating sloshing as, as key factors, maybe the most important, if I remember correct, from, your, from the poll, but also all the focus on boil-off rates, uh, mm. uh, which is also demonstrated by the questions here. And, and uh, as I said, uh, from us, for us at LNT Marine and for, for further development of LNT A books and so on, the optimization of boil-off rates is, is really key going forward and, and also what we are putting our efforts into. And luckily, we have a, by design, a, a good situation in our system where we have an insulation system separate from the tank, which gives us a lot of room to optimize and, and by theory, we have the best possible the low, the lowest possible boil off rates in the market, actually. Wow, thank, thank you, you very much. Uh, Chris, uh, we look forward to your thoughts, please. Well, very briefly, because I'm following two very, very distinguished speakers who've, um, I think, summed up uh, everything very well indeed. We've had a, a very good insight into the flexibilities and the opportunities to, to do things differently. And um, I, I was really quite taken with this seminar with the um, the, the results of a couple of your polls. So um, disputes, um, people agreeing, disagreeing, well, I suppose every dispute, there's a winner and a loser. But I think there are uh, ways of handling these things. And uh, I think best if you avoid getting in there. And there are people who can advise this. But most important, I thought the takeaway uh, was that poll about are we doing enough to spread the lessons of history? I did mention this several times. And there is a wonderful little book by one of the pioneers called Roger Fuchs, who was the designer on one of the original Type A ships, the Methane Princess Progress. And that contains so many wonderful lessons. And he's uh, uh, interviewed live on the um, SICTO website. Sadly, he passed away a couple of years later. Um, there are uh, ways of learning the lessons of history. And if we fail to learn them, then we're doomed to repeat the mistakes. So 
Um, yes, I think I've taken that on board and I think I'll be discussing this with SGMF and SIGTO to make sure that we redouble our efforts. So thank you for an excellent uh, seminar. It's been very interesting and thank you for inviting me to participate. Thank you all for an excellent uh, seminar. Echoing Chris's comments, I think over the last 45 minutes or so, we've all been treated to some very good insights and certainly lessons on this all important topic of selecting the right cargo containment system. Ladies and gentlemen, this brings to an end our webinar generously sponsored by LNT. Tomorrow we continue with a further webinar which looks at resolving MEG4 market confusion, very hot topic. Uh, join us at three o'clock British summer time for that one. I look forward to seeing you all there. And then next week we look at an entirely new batch. It is the Maritime Leaders Webinar Week. We do in the mix have a session with LNG industry leaders, so be sure to tune in for that. The way in which you keep abreast of what's going on is log on to www.rivieramm.com forward slash webinars and you'll find a listing of upcoming webinars as well as access to our library of previous webinars. So well worth bookmarking that. Riviera for its part will continue to serve the information that matters to you most. We will do this through our weekly newsletter, our magazine, curated content online that matches your interest and of course through relevant events such as this. The way in which you absolutely ensure you don't miss out is you register. Please visit the following page www.rivieramm.com forward slash registration. I promise it only takes half a minute and as a result mm -hmm. you're in the loop and you will be kept up to date on developments happening in your industry. More than enough from me, safe to say thank you very much indeed to our panelists, Carlos, Kettle and Chris. My thanks to you, dear audience, for coming from near and far for joining us for what I'm sure you'll agree has been a very stimulating 45 minutes. I will email you the survey. Um, again, it's something that takes a few minutes to complete and the dividend is you get answers in writing to the questions posed, including those that we weren't able to get to during the course of the webinar. Again, I'd like to underline my thanks to LNT for sponsoring today's session. Mm -hmm. All that remains on behalf of myself and the panelists is to thank you again, to wish that you stay safe and well wherever you happen to be. And for now, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. And until tomorrow, goodbye.